and the Olympics, a long-standing partnership. Again, at the Winter Games of Calgary, the Olympic tradition continues. Consider some American sports classics. The Kentucky Derby is always held in Louisville. The Indy 500 is always run in Indianapolis. The Super Bowl site is always predetermined by the start of the season. But the World Series is a thoroughly movable feast, and your town never knows it's coming your way until days before. And if you live in the Minnesota Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul on this clear, cool night, the World Series has come to you. To the Hubert H. Humphrey Metrodome, and for the first time in history, it will be played inside under a dome of Teflon-coated fiberglass before a crowd which has been known to make an airport runway seem tranquil by comparison. Settle back and enjoy the ride. Sports presents the American League champion Minnesota Twins against the National League champion St. Louis Cardinals in game one of the 1987 World Series. The Cardinals clinched the pennant Wednesday night in St. Louis by shutting out the Giants in the decisive seventh game of the playoffs. While the Twins already had their flag in hand by virtue of Monday's clinching victory over the Tigers. Guiding the two teams that got here are one rookie manager and one wily, crafty leader. The crowd is already at fever pitch. Pre-game warm-ups. It's the Metrodome, and it's game one of the 1987 World Series, the St. Louis Cardinals against the Minnesota Twins. I'm Al Michaels. Welcome to Minneapolis in game number one, and welcome to a very improbable matchup in this World Series. Consider first the Minnesota Twins, rarely in a minute race through the 80s, the first time they've won the pennant since 1965. And remember that with a week to go in the 1986 regular season, the Minnesota Twins were in last place in the American League West, they eventually finished in front of Seattle, and then it took them six and a half weeks to name a permanent manager. It turned out to be Tom Kelly. He was named in late November of 86, and he, in his rookie year, has led them to the promised land. Then there are the St. Louis Cardinals. Not improbable they're in the series because it's the third time in six years, but under the circumstances, amazing. Tremendous adversity last year. They were never in the race. The same kind of adversity and an unbelievable amount of injuries in 87, but Whitey Herzog with paste and glue and tacks and the rest of it has them here. You know Jack Clark is not here. You know Terry Pendleton is here, but he is injured. In the Cardinals starting lineup tonight are three rookies and one veteran who hit 080. It's a World Series. You go figure it out. Game one coming up. St. Louis against Minnesota. Game one, let's meet the lineups and the public address announcer here at the Metrodome is Bob Casey. And now let's welcome the 1987 National League champion, St. Louis Cardinals. First, the non-starters, the coaches, and the support staff. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Cardinals starting lineup for game one. The manager who has led the Cardinals to postseason play in three of the last six seasons, number 24, Whitey Herzog. Leading off. Major League leading base dealer, number 29, left fielder Vince Coleman. Batting second, he posted a 303 batting average during the regular season, the highest mark of his career. Number one, shortstop Ozzie Smith. Batting third, 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 batting third,
next week, most of the 381 average of the League Championship Series, number 26, Petra Tony Pena. Fighting seventh is 3 1 home run in game seven of the in house EFF propelled the Cardinals to the National League pennant, number 11, right fielder Jose Opindo. Fighting eight, making his first postseason appearance, number 19, designated hitter, Tom Pagnagazzi. Body five, a 333 hitter of the late championship series, number 12, third baseman Tom Wallace. Warming up in the right field bullpen, the eighth rookie pitcher ever to start a World Series opener, number 41, pitcher Joel McCrane. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the 1987 American League champion, our old Minnesota Twins. First, the non starters, the coaches, and the support staff. And now, let's welcome tonight's starters for the Minnesota Twins. He led the Twins to their first finish. 17 years, number 10, manager Tom Kelly. The leadoff hitter, he led the Twins in stolen bases in his first American League season, number 32, left fielder Dan Blandon. Batting second, he established career highs in batting average runs, doubles and triples during the regular season, number seven, shortstop Craig Gagney. Batting third is 333. Batting average during the regular season was the highest by a twin since Rock Carew at 78. Number 34, center fielder Kirby Puckett. <laughs> Batting fourth, the most popular and valuable player in the league championship series, number eight, third base with Jerry Gaetti. Batting fifth, he holds the American League record for hitting safely in 12 straight series games. Number 18, designated hitter Don Baylor. Batting sixth, a four drop hitter with two home runs, dying out of the eyes of the League Championship Series, Tommy Brunetsky. Batting seventh, he's had a personal best in the regular season of home runs, walks, stolen bases, number 14, first baseman, Keith Herbert. Body 80, helped the Twins flip the American League West title with four RBI September 28th game in Texas, number four, second baseman Steve Lepidosi. Body 9, his season included personal best in games, home runs, and RBI, number 15, catcher Tim Lutter. Warming up in the bullpen, the winningest left hander in baseball the last four years, number 16, pitcher Frank Viola. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we are on tonight to have the joint service of cover guard representing the Army, Marine Corps, Navy, and the Air Force. tonight is a lady whose career hit a high note a year ago when she was honored with the Grammy Award. She has sung at the White House and performed around the world, including a tour of Japan earlier this year with the famed Tom Basie Orchestra. To honor America with our national anthem, Major League Baseball is proud to present Miss Diane Schur.
with game one of the 1987 World Series after this message from Major League Baseball and a word from your local station. The National League champion St. Louis Cardinals against the American League champion Minnesota Twins in game one of the 1987 World Series. And this ABC Sports exclusive is being brought to you by Merrill Lynch. At Merrill, we believe your world should know no boundaries. By Budweiser, Beechwood Age for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. By the heartbeat of America, today's Chevrolet. And by GE, we bring good things to life from aircraft engines to appliances to plastics to financial services. And over 54,000 filling the Metrodome in downtown Minneapolis. Game one of the World Series, the St. Louis Cardinals, the Minnesota Twins. I'm Al Michaels, and first let's begin with the Minnesota Twins, who tonight become the first team in the history of baseball to go into the World Series having been outscored during the regular season. They were outscored. They were out hit in terms of average. They were out homered. The opposition had more stolen bases and they were out pitched in terms of earned run average. They were out everything except at this point there are 13 teams in the American League that are out of the World Series and the Minnesota Twins are in as I turn to Tim McCarver people want to know how did the Minnesota Twins win the American League pennant. Well you told me to go figure it out a little while ago so I decided to do that even though the Minnesota Twins won only 85 ball games which was by the way the lowest of the divisional championship teams they took charge the latter part of August as a matter of fact from the last part of August to the last part of September they were 18 and 9 and they just obliterated the Detroit Tigers in the American League Championship Series winning four out of five with near perfect baseball and speaking of perfection that's exactly what the Cardinals had the first half of the year they were nine and a half in front of Montreal and the Mets in the middle of July it was Wendell to a game and a half in early September. They hung on, and I guess you could say they are limp and lame, but because of their pitching and their deep pitching staff, five left-handers, four right-handers, they uh, are, I think, a bit of an edge in the series so far. And Whitey Herzog able to add an extra pitcher, Lee Tunnel, Jack Clark, in effect on the disabled list. And on the subject of pitching, who better to tell us about that and the difference between the way these two staffs are set up than Jim Palmer? Well, it, it, contrast what Timmy said one of the weaknesses that the Minnesota Twins has is in the depth of their starting pitching and that's something you really can't hide over 162 games but you can do it in a playoff or a World Series the two guys they're going to rely on are Fly Levin and Viola Viola will pitch tonight you'll see the record 45 and 28 in games they started and you can see the records of the other starters now also another thing that's very important earn run average of Viola and Bly Levin about three and a half runs the rest of the pitching staff about 5.5 so and the Cardinals have great depth Tim said I favor the Twins only because of the injury to Terry Pendleton. He had such a great year, they're going to miss him offensively. He might hit a little bit left-handed, but they will miss his glove at third. And tonight in game one of the World Series, the pitching matchup, a rookie against a veteran, first-year man Joe McGrain against Frank Viola. Aimed by downtown Minneapolis, and time now for the ceremonial first pitch. And now, ladies and gentlemen, throwing out tonight's ceremonial first pitch, a who needs no introduction to baseball fans. He ranks fifth in the all-time home run list with 573 career, career home runs and ranks second only to Babe Ruth among the American League sluggers. He spent 22 seasons in the major leagues and is a member of the Baseball Hall of Fame, making the toss from the commissioner's box on the third base side, the Twins' own Harmon Killebrew. Everybody waving their Homer hankies as you look at the St. Louis lineup tonight. The speedy Vince Coleman to lead off, and Ozzy Smith and Tommy Herr batting third. Jim Lindeman, rookie first baseman, cleanup. Willie McGee, the veteran in center. Tony Pena does the catching. Game seven hero, Jose Okendo, is in right. The designated hitter is a rookie, Tom Pagnazzi, and Tom Lawless, he of the 080 average, bats ninth. 
Defensively, the Twins in the outfield. Dan Gladden, who came over from the Giants in the spring. Kirby Puckett and Tom Brunanski in the outfield. The infield, the G-men at third and short. Gaetti and Gagne with Lombardozzi at second. And Ken Herbeck, the native Minnesotan at first. Tim Laudner does the catching. Frank Viola is on the mound, and one of the features we'll have for you during the series, Paul Molitor and Tony Gwynn have assessed the pitchers, and Molitor of the Milwaukee Brewers tells us about Frank Viola. Frank Viola's development of a changeup over the past two years has taken him from being a good pitcher to a great pitcher. The one thing he has to be careful about there is he occasionally might tip his pitches, holding his fastball lower in the glove as opposed to his changeup or his breaking ball, which he holds higher up into the webbing. The Cardinals should have some success stealing third against him, but he does a very good job of holding runners on first base. And there he is, and he's a man who has not lost a game in this building in almost five months, Frank Viola. Well, along with a great Twins home record, which was 56 and 25 during the regular season, another two in the playoffs, Frank was 11 and 3 here. And this is a, a park where they score him a lot of runs. Paul Molitor told us about. The fact that he has an excellent changeup, but he also throws about 95 miles, not 95, about 92 miles per hour, has a good curveball. And he said, the way I am going to have to get the St. Louis Cardinals out is basically not go 2 0, 3 1. Uh, if they get on, I'm not going to change my game. He does hold runners on very well at first base. Only six out of 15 have been able to steal on him this year. A very accomplished left handed pitcher. Now in postseason play six umpires, and they're split in the World Series three American, three national, as denoted on the right. Dave Phillips calls the balls and strikes. Lee Wire at first. Greg Cost will be at second. John McSherry, national third. Ken Kaiser of the American down the line in left. Terry Tata down the line in right. And that, of course, means in a seven game series, it would be Dave Phillips again back of the plate if we go the distance. So here we go. Game one of the 1987 World Series. And it begins with Vince Coleman, Ozzie Smith. And Tommy Herr. And the Cardinals, with a lot of switch hitters, even though Terry Pendleton is hurt and not in the lineup tonight, they still have a total of five in the lineup, including the first three. Frank Viola ready to get it underway. And a bunt. Viola fields, throws low, scoop in time. It's billed as Cardinal speed against twin power, and right off the bat, it's Coleman trying to bunt his way on, but a good play by Viola and Herbeck. A good play getting to the ball by Viola, but he threw a change up to first base, and look at the scoop by Ken Herbeck, a vastly underrated fielding first baseman. Looked like he threw that ball with three fingers. A lot of times that ring finger gets involved in throwing, and anybody who's throwing to a base doesn't like that. Ozzie Smith now takes a strike. Uh -huh. Coleman seated next to Danny Cox will be the pitcher in game two tomorrow. As a matter of fact, and talking about that ring finger, that's one of the things that makes Viola's straight change so effective. It's called the circle change, and it's thrown with the last three fingers of the left hand. That was it. And he's ahead on Smith. One and two. Another look now at Herbeck at first base, scooping it. Very close. And Lee Wire was the man right there to call it. One out, base is empty. Ozzy gone. Quickly two down. The crowd is already frenzied. Well, another look at the changeup, which makes him such an effective pitcher. Out on his front foot, his left shoulder is already open. Again, he has to respect the 90 mile per hour fastball. Doesn't have a chance. So two down, and now Tommy Hur, another switch hitter. There are his composite figures, but as a right handed batter, Hur this year hit 297. As a lefty, only 242. Coleman and Smith were superior from the left side. Her from the right side, which will benefit him against Viola. And they'll really miss Pendleton because Terry hit 337 right handed. Strike. 0 and 1. And Smith, who has been in two World Series, had never had a K affixed to his name in the scorebook until now. 
I think you'll talk to all hitters and what they say is that a lot of times the pitcher especially the first time around whether it's the first game the first at bat have an advantage. There's a chance that Ozzie Smith has never seen Frank Frank Viola doesn't really know what to look for a scouting report will only tell you so much. Most hitters want to see the guy especially maybe one or two times or one or two games. That plus the fact the Cardinals are playing in a foreign ballpark in a park where there are shadows where the lighting has been a problem for some batters. Steered by Viola and a one two three inning. So the Cardinals have gone in order after a half St. Louis nothing twins coming up. Cardinals gone in order and thus the twins come up in the bottom of the first inning with this lineup Gladden leading off and left Greg Gagne batting second then Kirby Puckett Gary Gaetti the uh, American League Championship Series MVP is the cleanup man Don Baylor who came over from the Red Sox in August is the DH Brunanski in right Herbeck at first Lombardozzi at second Laudner catching by the way in the World Series they will use the designated hitter here in Minnesota not in St. Louis in the AL Park yes and the NL Park no Coleman McGee Okendo in the outfield for the cards and then with Pendleton gone Lawless Smith her and Lindemann at first with Clark gone Pena back of the plate McGrain pitching he's a rookie and on our inside pitch Tony Gwynn of the Padres batting champ talks about McGrain I had a lot of trouble hitting Joe McGrain this year uh, he throws a fastball, breaking ball, changeup. Uh, but his best pitch is a fastball. And he sinks it, he runs it in and out. Uh, but I think the Minnesota Twins will have an opportunity to steal some bases against Joe. Even though he's left handed, he's real deliberate going to the plate. Wins assessment as the Twins come up now with Gladden, Gagne, and Puckett in the bottom of the first inning at the Metrodome. McGrain a rookie and it's unusual for a rookie to start in a World Series game the last time a rookie started a series opener was 1980 Bob Walk of the Phillies against Kansas City one reason of course is a long and extended playoff series if Whitey Herzog had his brothers and had they swept the Giants it would have been Cox or Tudor starting probably Cox and also the leg injury to Greg Matthews Joe McGrain never really at a loss for words as far as cuteness said so they must have held a lottery and they picked me an interesting year though started out five and oh then he went two and seven and won his last two ball games and he said the one thing he learned about pitching in the playoffs against the Giants was that instead of trying to pitch to the hitters weakness he has to go with his strength and as Tony Gwynn said that's the sinker away Glad hits it down to Ozzy Smith and the Wizard throws him out so Gladden is out number one in the bottom of the first inning and Greg Gagne will be the batter. As both Tony and Paul told you both pitchers are relying on the stuff that they talked about the sinker from Joe McGrain after the changeup from Frank Viola and Ozzie Smith you'll see a lot of movement when he throws the ball. Greg Gagne a totally different shortstop when he goes to his right he plants to throw. You rarely see Ozzie Smith plant and throw the ball. Gagne at the plate. Fouling it off. One thing Gagne said, I'm not competing with Ozzie Smith. I can learn from him over the next week. Yeah. By planting, of course, I mean the right foot when you go in the hole. Ozzie is in a constant state of motion when he throws the ball. When he goes to his right, you'll see him almost circle the ball to his right. Not so with Gagne. Outside one and one on Gagney who hit two home runs during the American League Championship Series. He's the kind of player who doesn't get a lot of headlines but when you watch him play on an everyday basis you begin to appreciate him more and more. One and two. Well, both, those, both of those home runs came on breaking balls and no doubt the advanced scouts for the Cardinals saw that. So really what you have is the grain strength which is the sinker running it away and occasionally coming inside against a guy that really is going to have better bat speed and is going to hit more longer balls on a, on the slow curveball or or something off speed. One two pitch is inside. You bring up an interesting point Jim because the way Gagne hits he curls the bat. There's a lot of bat movement and most of the time you see that bat curl with a lot of strong big big strong hitters. 
Mike Schmidt. Willie Stargell comes to mind. Now watch how he ends up. See that bat's curled around his head. Can't catch up to the fastball. And he becomes McGrain's first strikeout victim and quickly two gone here in the first and Puckett coming up. And we isolate now on Gagnon. See, when you curl the bat, you have farther to go with the bat. And that's why Jim said, when you throw the change up in the curveball, that actually speeds up the bat and allows a guy like Gagne to pull the ball. Kirby Puckett now, as popular as any of the Twins. Great season. And you saw what he did offensively, defensively. He took several home runs away with catches over the fence. One and with a seven foot high outfield fence in center here in Minnesota. Kirby able to reach over a la Eric Davis and take several home runs away. Chopper and Puckett can run. Her has to hurry and gets him. So the Twins are gone. Both teams out in order. No score after one in game one. Here's something you'll see quite a bit. There's Gagne going back, facing a new pitcher and trying to impart some information to Gaetti. It looks like Gagne is telling Gary that the ball was up and a terrific play by Tommy Hur to come up with that in-between hop. There's a big difference between an in-between hop and a short hop. The in-between hop, that that hop that's it's not true and it's not short. And for that reason, Tommy made a good play on that. However, a hop like that's easier to field on the artificial surface. Jim Lindeman now is the batter. Lindeman not only spelling Jack Clark at first base, but spelling him in the cleanup spot. And there is Jack Clark in uniform, but ineligible, not one of the 24. Fly ball to center. Puckett got a very late start on it and can't make the catch. And Lindemann goes to second. And the only oddity there is that Puckett plays in this ballpark all the time. You would expect that to happen to maybe Willie McGee and not Kirby. Well, one point that Tim and I were talking about, Al, before the game is, is the Homer Hankies and here you see Puckett not able to get to it does get it with the bottom of his glove which puts eventually Lindemann at second base but you have all these guys behind home plate with white handkerchiefs it's a much worse background than it has been all season so even somebody familiar and of course as Marty Springstead who's the head of the American League umpires here said even an umpire once you lose the ball you're not going to find it the roof is white and the background is white McGee now at the plate. Well, taking it a step further, the fans, knowing that, they could have the Homer Hankies out when the Cardinals were in the outfield and put them back in their pocket when it was Puckett out there. <laughs> well, that's a problem with the World Series. A lot of times you have fans that haven't been to baseball games that often, so they're going to have to learn, especially if they're going to keep this home field advantage. One and one, the count on Willie McGee, a switch hitter. Willie is a right-handed batter, 288, lefty 284, so he's pretty close to right down the middle. Well, he's always been that type of hitter. Uh, coming off knee surgery, started slow, didn't play till the middle of April. Go back to that MVP year he had when he hit 353. It was like 357 left handed, 350, uh, 48, I think, right handed. So numbers aren't quite as high, but. And the power numbers are about the same, too. One and two. The Cardinals have to scratch and claw, as you know, for runs. Man at second and nobody out. And McGee, if nothing else, at least trying to move him over. Again, talking about the circle change, Tim talked about it earlier. It's thrown the last three fingers. You kind of make like an OK sign. Well, what's so effective about a change up, and especially when a guy like Viola throws as hard as he does, is that the arm motion looks like a fastball. You swing at the arm. If you slow down your arm, it doesn't matter what the speed of the ball is. That's in the air and maybe deep enough to advance Lindemann. Puckett makes the catch. Lindemann tags. Puckett's throw comes through. Gagne, not in time, though. Gaetti thought he had him. Kirby with a strong and an accurate arm and Lindemann just does get there. Well this is why Bernanski and Dan Gladden lead the team in assists. People don't normally run on Kirby Puckett. You saw a perfect example there. Yeah, he positioned himself very well but this throw almost gets Lindemann. Look at the decoy set up by Gary Gaetti. It's like he's waiting at a bus stop and he thought he might have tagged him high. And if he made contact there I'll tell you he could have been out. 
because you could clearly see that the foot hadn't gotten to third base. John McSherry, the National League umpire, making the call. And so now the Twins play their infield back with a man at third and one out. But on this AstroTurf on the right side, halfway, which could be considered really in. There's a look. Gagne plays a deep in anyway as Pena swings and misses. Well, you can afford to do that for two reasons. You're playing on the rug, and on an artificial surface, the ball's going to get to you quicker. And plus, you don't have good speed on third base in Jim Lindemann. So a sharply hit ball to Gagne, even though he's back, you may have a play at home. And we saw him do that in the American League Championship Series. He plays a deep in and then begins to move in on occasion and can still throw him out at the plate. One and one. Tony Pena had a tough year. He was hurt early, wound up hitting 214, came over from Pittsburgh, and at the end of the regular season started to wear glasses. He had a good NLCS. Said it made all the difference in the world. Said he used to come into the locker room and couldn't see across the locker room. You can imagine trying to pick up a 90 mile per hour fastball. You saw him in this situation getting the run in 65% of the time. The league average is 50%. So he normally does the job. Two and two. Tony is a contact hitter but he's also a bad ball hitter and I think if Viola goes out of the strike zone either 2-2 two, two or 3-2 he's going to get him at least to go for a ball. Now he may make contact on it but it's going to be a pitch that Viola chooses as opposed to Pena. Viola 2-2 two and two, he'll keep Lindemann close at third working from a stretch. One out. Pretty good rip with two strikes. Well, he attempted to do exactly what Tim said. Tried to run the fastball in on him and up in the strike zone. But when you're a bad ball hitter, you sometimes get the bat on the ball. So Viola makes the pitch he wants to. And again, Pena with the glasses is a much more confident hitter. It's interesting that most bad ball hitters are forced by the very nature of the way they swing the bat to be contact hitters. They've got to make contact, otherwise you can't hit in the big leagues. Three and two the count. Tell you their scouting report I'm not much for World Series scouting reports but the scouting report I think came into play with Tony Pena on those last two pitches two high fastballs neck high. Lindemann at third one down and the three two pitch is grounded to Gagne and Gagne looked home and then opts to go to first so he was in that deep in position where he had the option but he felt the ball was just a bit too slowly hit to come home. Well, breaking on contact Lindemann doesn't have great speed gets a good jump and right there you see Gagne looking and takes the sure out. Again I think that has a lot to do with their feeling that they have ability to score runs. You know, a lot of times you take that gamble but Gagne chose not to do that. So the Cardinals break on top one nothing and Jose Okendo hits a high fly ball down the line and left. Gladden and Gagne are both there and Gladden has to backhand it in foul ground. But the Cardinals take the lead after one and a half one nothing St. Louis. We, we talked earlier about the different styles in fielding the balls. Watch Gagne and the, remember what we said he has to plan to throw effectively. Had this been Ozzie Smith. I think he comes home with the ball because of his style of throwing. He's going toward home and he'd take a chance whereas Gagne who's used to planning the right foot to make the throw didn't opt to take the chance. And it looked like had he thrown or been able to throw on the run he had a real good Close. shot to get him. Close. Gaetti starts the bottom of the second with a high fly ball to right field and it's Okendo looking up into the Teflon making the catch for the out. So much made about the dome here and it's funny because most people tend to think of the Astrodome but in reality this park is probably now more similar to Montreal 
now that Montreal has the roof than Houston. Well, it, it is, except that this roof is white and the roof in Montreal is orange. I and mean, Billy Martin said, why don't they spend $100,000 and paint the roof? Maybe it's a pretty good winner's job, Tim. I don't know, but I mean, this roof is white. It's more difficult to see the ball at night. And that's one of the objections. They think that the, this, you know, the AstroTurf is not going to bother the Cardinals. They play on it most of the year in St. Louis. This roof is white, but as you can see in that shot, and your color wasn't distorted if uh, it's aligned correctly on your set. It almost sends off an orange U as Baylor hits it in the air to shallow right. Now Okendo comes in a little gingerly for the moment and makes the play. Two down. Well, coupled with the fact, not only do you have the white roof, but you also have the white Homer Hankies, and the Twins' colors are red, white, and blue. I mean, to, for the outfielders and infielders, you could have blue and red Homer Hankies, maybe. As far as fielding <laughs> a baseball or change the color of the ball like Charlie Finley wanted to do 10 years ago. The orange orange. baseballs, yeah. right. Yeah. And it was Bob Euchre who said that couldn't be done because there weren't enough diseased horses. <laughs> Brunanski takes low in the count, 1-0. and oh. Two out, bases empty. Bottom of the second inning. Cardinals on top, one to nothing. Two and all the count. Tom Kelly. What you see is what you get. Modest, unassuming, bright guy, and a real good guy. Painted in some quarters as dull and boring. Not really. Three and all, but he's a guy who loves to let his players take all of the, the glory and, and the limelight. As he tries to stay out of the way. Now, Gaetti, I'm talking about Gary Gaetti, says just the opposite. He involves everybody, plays most of his roster, maybe not in the playoffs in the World Series, every three or four days to keep the guys interested and ready. Of course, Tom Kelly says if he thinks that, I guess I fooled him. 3 0. Oh, time was called. The plate umpire, Dave Phillips, was sending Ken Herbeck back to the on deck circle. Herbeck was trying to cheat over closer to home plate to get a better look at McGrain. And that's ball four. So now Kent comes out of the circle with Brunanski at first base and two down. And the reason for that is you can tell the more you're behind home plate, the more you can tell about a pitcher and the very fact that the Twins, unless they face McGrain at Orlando or St. Petersburg, the two towns in which the Twins and Cardinals train respectively, these hitters have not faced these pitchers, and you want every edge you can get. So the Cardinals ahead 1-0, the crowd waving the homer hankies for Kent Herbeck. Strike. Kent would normally hit higher in the order, but lefty against lefty, and he's dropped down to seven. It's fourth against right-handers, and you saw the 34 home runs. What changes is Joe McGrain on the mound. Of those 34 home runs, 28 against right-handers, only six against left-handers. So you take a lot of the power away when you throw a left-hander against Ken Herbeck. One and one to count. Herbeck, along with Brunanski, Gaetti, and Puckett, form what some call the fabulous four here. Guys who have been here a while and have been through some lean time. So it's particularly sweet for somebody like Herbeck in the World Series. Two and one. Another interesting point to bring up, at least from a pitching perspective, is the fact is you're going to face eight right-handers, and all of a sudden they throw one left-hander in there. So This is what Paul, excuse me, Tony Gwynn talked about. Tough to hit, but if you do get on, one of his problems is he's tall, 6'6", six, six, long time to get rid of the ball. But also when he throws to first base, he telegraphs it. He stands upright. He kind of falls backwards instead of rolling his right shoulder and giving the, the base runner a deceptive look. And another problem is he throws the ball to first base a little bit too softly. So a lot of runners in the National League have just taken off and tried to beat the throw to second base. Brunanski, who's really no slouch on the base pass, 11 steals this year. The runner at first, and the count is three and two. Well, the odds on running on a 2-2 count with two outs are really not good. 
because if the ball is a ball, then the count is three and two, and the runner's going to be running anyway. Good play by Pena. Balls that are in the dirt that are breaking balls are easier balls to handle because all catchers anticipate the breaking ball in the dirt. That was a fastball, and usually when a catcher can come up with it, it's because of quick hands. They've got to be quicker to come up with a fastball, or at least stop it. Three and two, so Bernanski will be running. He's off, and the pitch to Herbeck is fouled away. What a difference a three and two count makes versus trying to get the hitter out earlier in the count. As you said, Bernanski will be off, can score on a long single, most definitely with better than average speed, will score on the double. So a lot of times the difference between giving a run up with two outs sometimes is not where the ball is hit, is the count. Three and two. Lindemann playing normal depth at first, and it's ball four, and to the screen, Bernanski round second, but he'll hold there. So simply a walk. McGrain walking Bernanski and Herbeck with two down, and Steve Lombardozzi comes up. Well, McGrain walked a little over three a ball game this year. You see Tony Pena missing that 3-2 pitch where he handled the 2-2 pitch. But McGrain, a very unusual pitcher, he tied for the National League lead and hit batsman. Tied with Kevin Gross of the Phillies. He hit 10. He committed seven balks. So Joe, while he's got a fine young arm, doesn't do a lot of things to help himself. And with two out and nobody on, he's just walked two in a row. And now he goes to work on Lombard Dozy, whose average is not particularly high. He hit 238 during the regular season. But he has been a, a pretty tough hitter in the clutch. And against lefties in particular, as you can see. Well, they platooned him a lot of the year with Al Newman. You can see why Newman has not hit very well left handed, but he's played against a lot of right handed pitchers. Lombard Dozy tries to hit the ball back up the middle, worked with Walt Reniak, batting instructor with Boston from that area last winter. Brought his average up about 15 points this year. Now Mike Rourke, the Cardinal pitching coach, goes to the mound after McGrain had set down the first five. He's walked two and Rourke out there dealing in things mechanical. And you often see that with young pitchers. They have not mastered the art of pitching yet. They're working with their God-given talents. And that is, God gave him a good arm. But as far as the how to work a ball game and throwing strikes, two out, nobody on, he ends up walking Bernanski and Ken Herbeck. Herbeck, the only left-handed hitter in the lineup. When did you ever make that transition? I don't mean number, to say it, ever, but when Well, did it took you? a lot of years, and what you try to I think as a pitching coach is say listen you have a great arm and one of the problems is that his arm is so live that the ball moves so much let the ball go in the middle of the plate so what if it goes in or outside at least you want to throw it through the middle instead of trying to make perfect pitches. Two and oh Pena snap throw close play the back runner Herbeck getting in. Tell you, there are two catchers in the National League who throw from their knees. It makes an ex catcher think that maybe I did something wrong during my career. I threw standing up and could throw it as hard as Peña and Benito Santiago with San Diego from their knees. I mean, Peña's been doing that for 10 years, too. It's amazing the velocity he gets on those throws from his knees. 2 and 0 on Lombardozzi in there. Cards lead one to nothing. Bottom of the second inning, getting a good view in the Metrodome, where more than 54,000 look on. Two on, two out, and two and one on Lombardozzi. Two and two. The amazing one, Whitey Herzog. Right, look at Pena's target right in the middle. The ball just kind of sails in. Again, it's that live fastball. One will sink, one will sail. 
Sometimes it gets you in trouble, though. We've seen that with the two walks. And now it's full, and that means the runners will be going. Three and two with two down. We'll see Bernanski taking off from second. He acknowledges Rick Rennick saying it's three and two. And Ken Herbeck away to his lead at first. Whitey Herzog watching his team in the World Series for the third time in the last six years. There's no more helpless feeling, whether you're an infielder or a manager, than to stand out there and have your pitcher not to be able to throw the ball over the plate. Very frustrating. Makes defense a lot harder to play. You're on your heels instead of on your toes. Popped up. And Lindemann says he'll take care of it. And he makes the catch in fair territory. Twins squander a threat. One nothing cards after two will return after this word from your local station. Third inning. At the Metrodome and some advice from Rourke to McGrain. Well I've always felt like it's the pitching coach is like having a stepfather. Right in the dugout and he's always there to help you patience. I know that the pitching coaches I had Harry Burkeen George Bamberger Ray Miller pitching staff would run through the wall for him. Because they're always there when you need him and I'm sure what he's trying to tell him is just settle down. Giving him some mechanical help as you said Al and. He got out of the inning. Just wanted, wants to really minimize the amount of pitches he throws. Now Tom Pagnazzi, a rookie, fouls it away. Tom Pagnazzi, because of the absence of Terry Pendleton, they have Lawless playing third, and Lindemann, of course, spells Clark, and you need a designated hitter in the World Series. And so here is Pagnazzi, the number three catcher, grounding it to third. Fair ball, and Gaetti throws him out. One up and one down here in the third inning. The G-Man, they call him here in the Twin Cities. They call it the Gold Glove Man, too. Watch how he makes the play and kind of dodges the bag and pushes off that right foot to make the play. Good play by Gary Gaetti, who should win his second Gold Glove this year. It's amazing what, what kind of... Uh, Attention you'll get when you hit 30 home runs. He's always been an outstanding fielder, but all of a sudden you put those great offensive right. numbers up there, and people say not only can he hit, he can field. And he does both very well. Now Tom Lawless takes a strike. Lawless spelling Pendleton. And there is Terry. Now Terry, of course, hurt, pulled a, a rib muscle on the bases against San Francisco the other night. He can, what he can do is he can bat. Left handed period he can't hit right handed and he can't play third base so he will be the designated hitter tomorrow night. One and two. Hey that was quite appropriate to go to Terry Pendleton too because a lot of people who follow the National League think he's the best fielding third baseman in the National League now. And it's the point that you took Jim not until your offense catches up to your defense do you get the proper recognition. And he has had his career year. Batting average went up to 296. His walks went up. Home runs went up. RBIs went up. 96 RBIs. So to miss him, and it's, it's I guess, contrasted to 85 when Coleman was out of the lineup, as you see Viola blown right by him. You're really missing one of the key players, not to mention the loss of Jack Clark. Lawless, who was up only 25 times in the regular year and had two hits and then had two more hits in the playoffs, becomes strikeout victim number two. When I was talking to Tom Kelly, the manager of the Twins, he's, I said, what's the difference between Frank Viola this year, 17 and 10, with a 2.90 ERA last year? I won 18 games, but an ERA of about four and a half runs a game. He said it's the amount of pitches. And the contrast between Viola and McGrain tonight is that Viola used to get into the fifth or sixth inning, have 90 pitches. Now he minimizes his pitches, and McGrain has been throwing at least 25 pitches an inning so far. 0 oh and 1 on Coleman. For Vince Coleman, he is the fellow who was run over by the errant tarp at Bush Stadium in the playoffs in 1985 and that cost him a chance to play in the World Series. He had to sit and watch. 0 oh and 2. Well, such an impact player. Raised his on base percentage, stole 109 bases, only thrown out 
twenty two times so when he gets on first it's almost a double maybe not against Viola because he has the good move but just about every other pitcher sometimes a triple because he has stolen second and third on numerous occasions this year one ball two strikes the count Coleman grounded out in the first inning and strikes out here in the third and it's three strikeouts for Viola after two and a half St. Louis one Minnesota nothing. The Metrodome in Minneapolis, Al Michaels along with Jim Palmer and Tim McCarver, game one of the 1987 World Series. The Twins, as you can see here, Tim Laudner catching 18 games over 500 with the backup catcher, Sal Butera, 12 games under 500, which is one reason when you look at Laudner's average for the year that he is in the lineup. 191 but he's a dangerous if there's such a thing as a dangerous 191 hitter you're looking at him 16 homers strike no more dangerous dangerous than in the American League Championship Series he got one hit against Detroit it was a game winning double in game two against Jack Morris and you know that stat is not really a knock at Sal Butera because Sal was traded to the Twins actually picked up after released from the Cincinnati Reds in the early part of June and it points out that a pitching staff has to get used to pitching to one catcher not two or three. You rarely see pitching staff successful Jim when they have to work with two or three catchers so a manager would be less apt to platoon a catcher than other positions. No balls two strikes to count on Tim Laudner leading off in the bottom of the third one and two. A lot of the hits that Laudner got in the, the playoffs were on breaking balls. He is very much like Greg Gagne, except more powerful. He is a better breaking hit. I what I call a slider speed bat. In other words, if you throw him a slider that's usually about eight or nine miles per hour slower than a fastball, he catches up. But you can throw the fastball right by him, inside part of the plate, outside. That's hence the 191 batting average. Lee Wire says no swing, not even close. The way he shook his head. Two and two. And it wasn't even close. Yeah, Lee said, don't, don't bother me. He had that kind of look <laughs> yeah. on his face. Well, except that's the catcher's duty. He wants to get every out he can, and Penny just said, take take a chance. Maybe he'll go for it. And he didn't. Two and two. Laudner leading off in the bottom of the third, then Gladden and Gagney. Cardinals on top. One to nothing. Full count. So McGrain making it tough on himself. After he had set down the first five tonight, he walked two, went two and zero oh on Lombardozzi, and then got him. Now he's gone from zero oh and two to three and two on Wadner, and he loses him. A lot of pitching has to do with pace and rhythm, and that is the fourth. 3 2 count in a row run by Joe McGrain. Even when he got Lombardosi, it was a 3 2 count to pop up to end the inning. Dan Gladden now. The Twins, and you're wondering maybe why they were able to do it in one season go from next to last to first. Jeff Reardon, of course, a tremendous acquisition. Kelly, and also. Dan Gladden who grounds this one to third lawless goes down to her and that's all they're going to get just the four so Gladden who has good speed and led the team in steals this year with a total of twenty five is at first base with one out always an amazing game you walk three out of four hitters and the pitcher swings at the or excuse me the hitter swings at the first pitch and a curveball pretty good one at that Wallace knows where he's going to get an out her knows there's no chance for a double play because Gladden can run well I'll tell you there are two schools of uh, thought to that particular theory and I know what you're saying if he's going to if he's going to get wild or if he got wild let him stay wild the other side of the coin is that he is so wild that he's going to put a pitch with not as much on it right down the middle of the plate and you've got a chance to get on a cheap one unfortunately for Gladden that wasn't a cheap one quality pitch Gagney now with Gladden held on by Lindemann and as you said Al 25 stolen bases 18 out of 21 successful steals against McGrain perfect 
perfect opportunity for the Twins to run. Very aggressive in the American League playoffs. I think they shocked Detroit. Not that the catchers, he throws pretty well for Detroit. Mac Notes had trouble all year long, but they ran with reckless abandon. Anytime, hit home runs, did it all. Very aggressive ball club. So Lee Wire there kind of peek around Glad Lee Wire, of course, a National League umpire. And remember, in 170 innings, McGrain was called for seven balks. That's close. That is close. Well, the rule there, and I think what you're talking about, is that you cannot take the right leg and bring it behind the pitching rubber. If you do, you have to come home plate, to come to home plate. So what Joe is trying to do is either get right on it, more or less like Steve Carlton, some of the guys with the good moves, and Lee Wires is over there to either call it or not. He has a great perspective. The interesting thing, you mentioned Steve Carlton. Steve Carlton holds the National League record for box in a season. And Steve had a similar move that Joe McGrain had. Steve had 11 in 1979, and that was Joe McGrain's hero when he was growing up. And Steve pitched for Minnesota this year. They picked him up in August and made hook up with him again in spring training next year and he almost throws a change up away well, that's what Mike Rock talked about he said not only does he not have a great move when he does throw the ball over he doesn't throw it with enough on it looked like he was caught in between there Jim it looked to me like he thought he had gone back too far with his right leg and threw it to first base and threw that change up over there almost knowing he was going to get caught I think that's what seven in a row now. Give or take one. What you will find that the good left handers such as Jimmy Key the guy we saw in the last day of the season. What they do is that since you're careful you're really worried about that leg coming behind the rubber what you do is you put the knee behind the rubber kind of arch your knee and you deceive the runner. That's how Key gets away with it. It's not a balk, but it's very deceptive. I've never heard that before. In other words, it's his knee that goes by the back leg and not his foot. But this is not something you expect of a rookie pitcher. I saw Mike Flanagan, who has one of the best moves in the American League. They run on his first move. They would take a gamble, and they'd go. Now he worked on it. He's obviously a veteran. You don't run on a Mike Flanagan. You run on a Joe McGrain. Well, with all this going on, you lose sight of the situation. The score is one to nothing, St. Louis. There is one out, and that's Gladden at first base, as if you didn't know. As if McGrain didn't know. <laughs> and that's a new World Series record, unofficial. Nine straight. I'd make it official. Yeah, I would too. There's a scoop and it's 0 and 1. He, he might he should do this more often because he throws more strikes. I mean he throws over there eight straight times. He's having trouble throwing strikes. You'd think it ruin his concentration. And then he throws a fastball over the plate. It's amazing. Of course I mean this is the same guy they said that used to when he was pitching in Shea Stadium would check out the aircraft to see if they were on schedule. I mean he they, Whitey says he comes from planet seven which is one of the furthest planets away. He's wonderful. So he, yep. Got to love the way he thinks. One and one. Well, a lot has been made about McGrain's flakiness. Don't fool yourself. He is an extremely intelligent fellow. Yes, sir. His father is a college professor at Moorhead State University. And McGrain, as quotable as any rookie I can recall in years, knows exactly what he's saying and doing. He's playing a game with the media as well. One and one. One and two. McGrain, you remember, was he was the guy earlier this year when he went on the disabled list. Somebody said, "What have you been doing?" He said, "I've been reading a book, JFK, the man, and the airport." <laughs> That's him. He's a communications, or was a communications major at Arizona, and it would figure. Popped in the air and a tough play. Okendo and her and Lindemann and it falls between them.
So the count is still a ball and two strikes on Gagne with one out and Gladden at first. Well, one of the major distractions along with the roof are the pitching mounds. The warm-up mounds are on the field. The ball does not fall that close, but you're, if you're a first baseman, you're thinking about it. Second baseman has the better angle, Tommy Herr. Okendo, who knows if he saw it. I guess with all the injuries and everything that the Cardinals have had, to be topical, you could say they didn't want it to be a fatal distraction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> one two pitch a change is popped up and Lindemann and her are there and Tommy calls Lindemann off and makes the catch in foul territory for the second out. The center fielder, Kirby Puckett rounded out in the bottom of the first inning. If you pick this up late, the only run in the game, the Cardinals in the second inning. Jim Lindemann hit a fly ball in the center. Kirby Puckett got a late start on it, and it dropped for a double. Willie McGee with a fly out long enough to move Lindemann to third. And then Tony Pena grounded to short. And Greg Gagne opted to go to first base, and Lindemann scored. So the Cardinals stretched out a run, as they are prone to do, and lead one to nothing. Good what play. Good play. Pena, Pena has such quick hands back there. A lot of times uh, his hands are too quick, and uh, he, he, his hands are so quick that a lot of times he, he loses form when he goes after balls in the dirt. Usually when you see a catcher go after a ball in the dirt with his glove, it's the wrong way to go about it because they want the ball to hit and then hit the chest protector. But Tony is so quick. He has as quick a hands for a catcher as any catcher I've seen. Crowd chanting Kirby, Kirby. Gladden goes, pitches a strike, and Pena throws a one hopper, not in time. Her thought he had him. No, says Greg Kosk of the American League. Pena this year threw out only 25% of would be base dealers. Makes a good one hop throw, but again, you steal the base on the pitcher. It took Gladden a long time to figure out McGrain, but it got a good jump and beats the throw. Another look from another angle. He said 25 during the regular season. Made a big difference to this ball club. A lot of added speed. One and one on pocket. I'll, I'll tell you, I know it sounds strange, but the lower the arc of the ball thrown, the faster it gets to second. Even though this ball bounces, it's a perfect throw. Everybody has a tendency to say, well, he bounced the throw to second. That ball was right there, and had Gladden not get, had the jump off of the grain, he wouldn't have stolen the base. Puckett swinging late at a fastball, and it's two and two. So Gladden is at second, two down. Rick Rennick, the third base coach, and Kirby Puckett, who tied for the American League lead in hits this year at 207 with the Royals rookie Kevin Seitzer. Full count. Gaetti on deck. And that's what Kirby has to do to be successful. He has to have a good strike zone. He's not a bad ball hitter like Pena. I mean, he can hit the ball up and out over the plate. That's one of his strengths. But this is a guy that did not hit any home runs his first year, then four, 31 last year, and then 28 this year, and 332. And amazing stats. Grounded to Tommy Herr, a routine play. And the Twins done in the third. To the fourth we go in game one. Cards one, Twins nothing. Like a vehicle from McGrain's Planet 7, there sits the Metrodome fronting downtown Minneapolis. And inside, more than 54,000. one nothing fourth inning, and Ozzie Smith leading off for the Cardinals. Smith, Herr, and Lindemann, the two, three, and four hitters. Ozzie struck out in the first. And Viola gets the inside corner, one and one. Frank Viola, who won 17 during the regular year, 
half swing. He wanted to check it, and he grounds it down to Lombard Dozier. One away here in the fourth inning. Viola has yielded just one base runner. That the fly ball double that Puckett got a late start on by Lindemann in the second. Meanwhile, for Frank, his thoughts have to be partially elsewhere. His brother, there is John, and Donna Litt, the former Donna Litt, now Donna Viola, were married earlier today at a church in East Meadow, New York, on Long Island. Frank was to have been the best man as her bunts it down the line. And all we can say, I'm sure the reception is winding down Frank's thoughts with his brother and sister-in-law. And Donna, for your sake, we just hope this baby doesn't go into extra innings tonight. And we understand that the date was set a year and a half ago. And who would know that on that date, set a year and a half ago, that Frank would be pitching the first game of the World Series here in, in Minneapolis, especially after the finish, as you pointed out on the opening of the Twins last year. Mm -hmm. One and one the count. Well, 71 and 91 last year. That's, so he makes that 85 wins and the other four in the playoffs that that more meaningful. Of course Frank Viola pitching here tonight. To me the interesting thing about the matchup between a left hander and, and the Cardinals you talked about the fact that Coleman and Smith hit better from the left side. They also are the two best runners. So you turn them around. Viola's pitched very well, even though he's trailing. He conceivably could pitch three times. So, with Pendleton out, Clark out, you have a guy that you really have to rely on. One ball, two strikes to count. One out, base is empty. One nothing, St. Louis in the fourth. Hits sharply to third. Gary Gaetti on a hop, and over to Herbeck, who comes off the bag for the tag. So two down now in the fourth inning. And Jim Lindeman coming up. That again, one of those in between hops. Infielders rarely catch balls like this cleanly. They'll catch short hops cleanly, but the in between hops you have to smother, and you really have to smother with softer hands. Good play by Gaetti. It's kind of collapsed on it. Uh -huh. Just waited for the ball to come to him. I mean, that's that is the definition of soft hands, not uh, hands of rock. It's one that just kind of cushions the ball as it comes in towards you. Gaetti certainly. Showed him there. Anytime you see an infielder going down with the glove, they're stabbing at the ball. The good ones come up, catch it with soft hands. Jim Lindeman takes a strike and the count one and one. First Tommy could almost see that a collision was imminent and he just pulled up. He's out anyway. Late swing by Lindeman who might be eventually, even though he's the first baseman here, Spelling Clark, the Cardinals' right fielder of the future. Well, he is the reason they went out and traded for Tony Pena. He had a great, you know, good year last year, 20 home runs, good winter ball. They thought it made Andy Vance like expendable, Mike Lavalier. That's hit into right field, and it's been all Lindemann offensively for the Cardinals tonight. Viola has retired every other batter, and Lindemann is now two for two. Along with Mike Dung, who went, went over to Pittsburgh and won 13 games, but Lindemann had a great spring. Let's take another look. The looper to center. This one he just fights off, but when you have good bat speed, even if you get jammed, you can fight the ball off. A guy with a slower bat most likely would break his bat, give the infielder time to get in front of that ball. Especially on the turf, though, here. I mean, you hit them where they're not, and they hit the ball sharply, you have no chance at all. McGee in the dirt. One and oh on Willie. Willie McGee bothered by that wrist, but still 308 in the National League Championship Series. And a nice running catch early in game six, which eventually wound up as the Cardinals' 1 0 victory to tie the series. A catch off the bat of Jose Uribe. Mm -hmm. One and one. Lindemann held on by Herbeck. Toward the hole, backhanded by Gagne, throws back to second. No! Lombardozzi thought he had him. He scooped it out. 
The second base umpire, Greg Cost, says safe. They said first and second. Well, Gagne really had only one play. The short hop, watch. Nope, the high hop there, and he does all he can to throw it to Lombardozzi, but Lindemann made a nice play. Sliding straight in. I'll tell you, the day of the hook slide is gone. You rarely see base runners hooking into bases, and the reason for that is you get there quicker when you go in straight in. He Lind was clearly safe, too. Pardon me, Al. Lindemann at second base, and McGee, the runner at first, with two down. Tony Pena grounded out in the second to drive in Lindemann. One one. Pena with that huge swing. You would think he hits a lot of home runs, but he doesn't. He hit five during the regular year. His high was 15 with the Pirates a couple of years ago. Tony doesn't get cheated. You gotta love to watch him hit. Really kind of corkscrews himself into the ground with those swings at the high fastball. Only two. Reminds me so much, excuse me, Tim, uh, of Manny Sanguin, who was a bad yeah. ball hitter. Also, the type of stroke, it's not an uppercut stroke. You hit down at the ball, you're going to hit more line drives, more ground balls. And I'm talking to Johnny Lewis, the batting instructor. He said, that's what we want our guys to do. When Clark's not in the lineup, fly balls, kill us. They're outs. We want those line drives and ground balls. 0-2 pitch, foul away. Funny, you talk about Sam Gian. Payne has got that same rubbery body that Manny had, or has, <laughs> with talking right, about yeah. that. He's in its past tense. Johnny Lewis is the... Cardinal hitting instructor. This year, last year when they had that bad offensive year, he laid low. He couldn't find him. <laughs> I was kidding him about that. He said, this year, I work with Clark a lot. He had 35 home runs. <laughs> oh, two to Pena. Still nothing in two. I was going to say the jury really is still out as, as to that trade. What team was uh, really positively affected? The trade to Pittsburgh that sent Mike LaValliere and Andy Van Slyke and Mike Dunn over there, all of whom had very, very good years. Mike Dunn may be the National League Pitcher of the Year, Rookie Pitcher of the Year. Tony Pena, though, you really can't equate really what happened to him earlier in the year when he broke his thumb early April and he was out for six weeks because when he came back, he tried to make up for lost time. And in my opinion, his skills did not diminish at all. This guy is still a quality catcher. And the bottom line is the St. Louis Cardinals are in the World Series. Right. Steered by Viola, who helps himself out of the inning. Cardinals squander two singles. St. Louis won. Minnesota nothing. Going to the bottom of the fourth. himself. Oh Smith, as if you didn't know which Smith it was, huh? <laughs> A lot of people have been saying, oh, since he's played in the major league. I, th I would have thought he'd thrown more pitches with the, with the yeah, me too. four walks and the struggling. What's made him effective, Tim? And, and this is a lot like Juan Berenguer, who we saw pitch in the playoffs for Minnesota. Gaetti grounds it down the line, backhanded by Lawless and too late. Twins have their first hit. Gary Gaetti gets an infield single, and Don Baylor will come to the plate. Well, going back to that thought, is that that he doesn't throw the ball consistently in any spot. As you watch Gaetti dive to it, excuse me, Lawless dive to his right. Gaetti hit the ball. It's a play that Pendleton may have made only because he has a stronger arm. Lawless, great. Great play to get to the ball, but that's the difference between a Pendleton. And Baylor hits it up the middle for a base hit. Gaetti takes a short turn at second as the throw comes in behind him. And get ready for a little bit of noise in the Metrodome. <laughs> the 
see the mobility of Wallace. Again, a utility infield. Did not play that much. He played all around. Just does not have as strong as arm. So the Twins, who trail 1-0, runners at first and second. The crowd waving the Homer hankies as Brunanski stands in. walk in the second inning. He's checking with Rennick. It doesn't figure there's always the possibility though of the I wonder if they have sacrifice Yankees here. <laughs> no way he's bunting. Not with the American League Championship Series that he had. Mm -hmm. Ripped in the center for a base hit in front of McGee. Rennick will hold Gaetti at third and they're loaded with nobody out. I'll tell you, it's amazing. Joe McGrain in the second inning and the bottom of the third inning ran three two counts to four straight hitters. Well, on four pitches, the Twins had the bases loaded and nobody out. Gaetti gave him a look, but with nobody out, Rick Rennick held him at third, and that is proper. Even though with two outs and they send him, you probably score a run, but with nobody out, you just can't take the chance. There was a conference at the mound. Whitey Herzog looks on, and he has sent Bob Forsh to the bullpen. There he is. One of the three starting pitchers, really a swingman that won 11 games for the Cardinals. Rourke now, Mike Rourke goes to the mound again. Singles by Gaetti, Baylor, and Brunanski, and now Herbeck coming up, the left-handed batter, the number seven hitter. Part of this is for Mike Rourke to talk to Tony Pena and Joe McGrain to give Forsha a chance to warm up a little more in the bullpen. You see another couple of hits, you might see a move by Whitey. Meanwhile, Whitey, and he, he earns it. He sits on a piece of patio furniture. And on site, and Tom Kelly, a rookie manager, first rookie manager to get it to the World Series since Harvey Keene did it with the Brewers in 82, and Harvey took over in the middle of that year. Tom actually took over the latter part of last year. He was 12 and 11 with the Twins last year. And they did take some time in naming him the manager for the 87 season, but Andy McPhail obviously made the right move. The Twins with a 36 year old manager and a 34 year old general manager. Oh, and one on Herbeck. So the bases are loaded. Nobody out. Dietti at third, Baylor at second, and Brunanski at first. Great presence of mind by McGrain as you watch Ken Herbeck taking a look at what's transpiring over third base. One of the most difficult things is to give up a two run single and then cover the base you're supposed to. But McGrain did it at 23. Not happy about the outcome, but there to save him another run. Twins lead. Lombardozzi takes inside. 
and the Cardinal infield back at short and second. But remember, Ozzie throws on the run on a hard ground ball. He's got a chance to throw out Bernanski at the plate. Well, I'll tell you, with the difficulty the Cardinals have scoring runs, I think the proper play is to pull the right side up because Lombardozzi is not going to hit the ball with authority to the right side. At least that's the theory on which you have to go. In the dirt. 2-0, and, oh, and there's her playing well back and Lindemann at first. Now you think about this, a ground ball to Tommy Herr, you get the out at first base, Herbeck moves to third, Brunanski scores, and not only is it 3-1, to one, but the Twins have, in effect, moved another runner at third with less than two outs. I and think Herr ought at least be halfway. 2-1 the count. And especially with the type of attack the Cardinals have, and with Clark not there and Pendleton not there, right. even though they were a resilient and resourceful team, this is a team that's going to find it very difficult to come from behind. That's why it made it that much more remarkable when they came from behind against the Giants in game three of the playoffs. Down 4 nothing at one point. Commissioner Peter Ugaroff and Senator Bob Dole looking on. Commissioner looks stunned, but awestruck. Some sight, I'll tell you. And they're loaded, holding a third Brunanski. Whitey Herzog to the mound and to the bullpen. And so McGrain's world unravels here in the fourth inning. And Bob Forrest will come in. You see Pena blocked the ball. Again, with nobody out, you're not going to take a chance. So you stay at third base. Morris comes in with the bases loaded, nobody out. A rough fourth inning for Joe McGrain. Also a very typical AstroTurf type inning. Ground ball, broken bat hit, Wallace couldn't come up with it. One ball hit real hard, but he really did not help himself with his wildness. Force 11 and 7 on the year, pitched three times in the National League playoffs. It was 1 and 1. And Really, the, the high ERA is attributed to one time. He pitched less than an inning, didn't get anybody out. Three runs, or three hits, four runs, something like that. But other times, he pitched extremely well. He is a control pitcher. The 0-1 pitch is ground into right for a base hit. Bernanski scores. Kerbeck stops at third. They're still loaded, and it's 3-1. Talked earlier about Laudner. Slider speed bat. Slider away. He doesn't try to pull it. He just hits it the other way. It's a great philosophy of hitting on AstroTurf. He tries to pull that ball, no doubt. Will hit the ball to the shortstop. Double play ball. Now Dan Gladden still nobody out. In the inning, five singles and a walk. 3-1 Twins. Gladden 0 for 2. One and 0 to count. Herbeck is at third. Lombard Dozy at second. And Laudner at first. And Gladden is the leadoff hitter. And there's a beat. And what's a ball game without a beach ball these days? What beach is indoors? <laughs> The decibel level here at the Metrodome is so high, and if you watch any of the American League Championship Series, you know what this crowd is capable of doing, audio-wise. And so that's the reason McGrain was trying to block out the sound. What he really needed, though, in the fourth inning was a blindfold. In the air, down the line, and curling foul back out of play. Sure, the Cardinals are thinking this is the team that's supposed to hit 196 home runs, and they're doing what we normally do: five singles, 
Hitting the ball where it's pitched. Because they're not running as, as well as the Cardinals. A couple of one base at a time situations, but you can do that when you have three runs in, the base is loaded, nobody out. You don't take too many chances. Tom Kelly, he just sits and looks and wins. Fun foul off the end of the bat, one and two. Dan Gladden, who played with the Giants through last season, he came up as a center fielder. Then the Twins got him. The Giants found him expendable. He'd worn out his welcome in San Francisco. And he really wanted the Giants to beat the Cardinals. He was really looking forward to, to going back. Deep left field. Coleman goes back. A grand slam. the first ball. Armand Killebrew, 573 career home runs. That's only the ninth hit by Dan Gladden this year. Oh, boy. And we talked about the tremendous home record. You come in here, and if you're a visiting team, you usually don't like what you see, and that's no exception. Teammate of yours in 1970. You saw the last one, right, Jim? Herbeck tagging in case it was caught. It wasn't. And for the first time in 17 years, a World Series slam. Dan Glad. And the crowd has finally half settled down to the point where the game can resume. Gagney is the batter. 0-1. Still nobody out, and he's the eighth man to hit in the inning. Seven to one, Clint. To right field to Okendo. Stays with it for the out. And that's the first out of the inning as they have hit around now with Puckett coming up. Kirby is 0 for 2. If you're wondering about some World Series Grand Slam, McNally hitting the last one. Jim Northrup hit one in 68. I called it. Joe Pepitone. That's right. Yep. Joe Pepitone in 64. Ken Boyer. I called it. <laughs> Joe Pepitone. So two out of the last four I've called. Puckett grounds it to short. Smith is right there, playing it perfectly to throw him out. Two down, and now Gaetti, who started the inning with an infield single coming up. You know, the one by Kenny Boyer in the 64 series, one game four for the Cardinals against Al Downing, an 0-2 changeup, and a grand slam home run. The Cardinals won it four to three. That tied it at two games apiece, and the Cardinals went on to win in seven. 
There were two also hit in the 56 series, Yogi Berra and Bill Scourin. And then Chuck Hiller, remember, hit one for yeah. San Francisco against Whitey the Yankees. Ford. I think Whitey Ford. Ford was the pitcher, I believe. One open, one and one. So it sort of points up what we said at the top about the heroes. You, you never know where they'll come from. Mickey Mantle has hit a grand slam in the World Series. Yogi Berra has hit a grand slam. And now Dan Gladden. You really never know. One and two. We also talked about the depth of the Cardinal pitching staff before the game started. And I'm sure Whitey Herzog didn't want to use his pitchers in this fashion because of their depth in a seven to one blowout. Well, Porsche is a guy that has given him a lot of innings this year. 33 appearances during the regular season, 30 starts. So as we said, he's a swing man that they used in the playoffs for relief, but started normally during the season. And Whitey could get more use out of him tonight than he might in the National League part because of the designated hitter situation. So actually something he doesn't want to do is really a godsend in a way that he doesn't have to pinch hit for him. Tom. Which is a big difference between American League Baseball and, and National League ball. Something Tom we'll Ke see. Excuse me, Jim. Tom Kelly, on the other hand, can if, if this game gets out of reach, can pitch by all of six innings since he's only going to work on three days rest the next time out. High fly ball to center field, and this will finally do it. And McGee has lost it, and so is Coleman. And there is your basic Metrodome double. McGee initially looked as if he had it, then had no clue. And by the time Coleman could discover it, Gaetti has a double. Well, Vince knows it's up there. He sees it bounce. And he was looking at the ball all the way out, but does not really see it. Once it gets up into the roof, till it comes down and bounces. So he had no clue, and McGee had no clue. Baylor grounds it to third, and Wallace throws the first and throws it low. But the inning is finally over. 11 men to the plate, and it's seven to one, Minnesota. Furniture aside, no day at the beach for Whitey Herzog thus far. Seven to one, Minnesota, as we go to the fifth inning. And Jose Okendo to start things off. Then Pagnazzi and Lawless. Okendo foul to Gladden in the second inning. 0 for 1. Frank Viola leading by six. And isn't that a beautiful feeling for a pitcher? Well, it is, and he will not deter the way he pitches. He started him off with a changeup. No doubt, Okendo looking for a fastball. Doesn't get one, gets another changeup. This is why Viola has been such a special pitcher this year. We said 11 and 3 here at, it's hard to say the Homer Dome. I'm not, that's not actually the name, but that's the, the way it was the first year when we used to come in here. Very effective because you just never know what's coming. It's more of a run dome the way it's turned out and through the course of the series. We'll bring it up from time to time. It was misnamed in a way. It really produces no more home runs than your average ballpark, but more runs. Fouled away. Well, the first two. year it was named the Homer Dome only because they tried to get this stadium, this dome built under budget. They did not air condition it. The ball did carry much better the first year. The next year they put air conditioning in and the home runs. You still hit home runs, but the Twins are a home run hitting ball club. They hit it just as many on the road. Maybe not just as many, but the percentage is very close. There it is, and it's it's almost dead even. Home runs per 100 at-bats at the Dome and away. There are a lot of ballparks, especially in the American League. We'll take another look at that graphic. Like Seattle, where there's 40% more home runs hit up at the King Dome than there are on the road. Those figures over the last five years, and also this year, the telltale figure, more home runs hit in Twins road games than home games. Gagney drops it, picks it up, has time, and throws him out. One away, Pagnazzi coming up. And I asked Whitey Herzog about the keys for the Cardinals in winning this World Series. 
Well, we're going to have to get good pitching, and uh, we're going to have to hope that we can play well here these first two games. I saw the uh, the playoffs with Detroit. I know what happened there. Uh, we feel we got a little bit more of advantage. We're on turf, and uh, if McGrain tonight, especially, can just go out and pitch his ball game, let the ball fly, and keep the ball in the ballpark, then I think we got a chance. If they start hitting the ball out on us, it's going to be tough because when we get down now, we know that we're going to have to be aggressive on the bases. If we get some base runners, we're going to have to run. We're going to have to hit and run, but we're really going to have to be aggressive, and we're going to have to try and manufacture runs, and we're going to stay with the Twins. And right now they are down by six, and Pagnazzi has just grounded out to Viola. Two down, and Lawless coming up. Doral Norman Herzog loves to fish, loves to manage, <laughs> loves to win. <laughs> oh, he is great. There is no two ways about it. When you can take this team this year to the World Series, you can manage. That's really true. Now how about the three million people that enjoy watching the Cardinals play? And that's another amazing stat. But the Mets. Over three million this year. The Cardinals. Dodgers didn't do it this year, have done it in the past. But the Cardinals drawing over three million after a bad year last year. They had a great year in 85, winning the National League. Pennant. And then of course Kansas City beat them after they were up three games to one. They won three in a row. Game five in St. Louis, then six and seven in Kansas City. But Whitey, I don't think, has ever faced the adversity that he's faced this year. Especially in bringing a team to the, to the World Series. One and two the count. And you'll ask him things like, you know, is this your most satisfying year? And you, you really don't want to say it when you're coming right off it, but I suspect down the line, uh, when Whitey writes the memoirs, uh, this will have a, a very special chapter, 87. Everybody's making so much on the other hand of the Minnesota Twins in their 85 victories. I think we tried to highlight in the opening remarks that they are not the same team now that they were when they compiled those 85 victories. Really since the last part of August they were 18 and 9 in the month of September and they lost five insignificant games at the end of the year. But I mean they just blew the Tigers right out of the ballpark. Perfect. And they play with such such poise and such outward and obvious confidence. They look like a team that has been to the playoffs six times in the last 10 years. Yeah, they've really taken on the character of their manager, Tom Kelly. And for that, he deserves an awful lot of credit for a lot of other things, too. Like a raise? <laughs> He's <laughs> he already got, gotten it. He got one of those. He better have gotten one of those. I believe he was the lowest paid manager in baseball this year. If not, close enough. Tom Kelly, pitching coach Dick Such. Two and two. Getting ahead. Well, that's what they tell you from the first time you ever go to a minor league camp. Got to pitch ahead. You said it many times, a game of first, get the first batter out, the first pitch over. Two out, bases empty in the top of the fifth inning at the Metrodome, where it's seven to one, Minnesota. In a time call, there's some debris in the outfield. Thing about Viola, he certainly, as that graphic showed, he certainly has stayed ahead tonight. He has stayed ahead all year. He's 17 and 10. He had a marvelous, a marvelous year. Oh, you know, with, the, with the dome, we can't have a blimp, of course. But that's, that's a right. That's a, a pretty shot from yeah, about yeah. a mile away. You know, Ed Sherman of the Chicago Tribune had a great line. He said, "The outside of the dome looks like your grandmother's old Jello mold." <laughs> 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 that, that does depict it. <laughs> Grandmother's old Jello mold. Now, doesn't it look like that? Yeah. Strawberry with the lights on. Sure. Yeah. A little amber tone to it. <laughs> <laughs> Three two to Lawless is a little squibber foul. 
But staying ahead, getting back to that point that you made so well, Jim, is so important. But Viola has the added uh, ability to pitch well when he's behind in the count because hitters just can't sit on the fastball. You put those two combinations, the ability to stay ahead, and when you don't, the ability, the ability to pitch behind in the count, and you've got to pitch with the quality of Frank Viola. 3-2 pitch, got him. Strikeout number four. Cardinals gone in order at the end of four and a half. Seven to one, Minnesota. Frank Viola, very much in command. <laughs> it's not a sneeze, is it? No, that's an exhale. Well, it's just that you can apply the same thing. If you look at Bert Blylevin on your right, Juan Baron Gare on your left. If you lift weights, you don't hold your breath. The exhale, same with pitching. Bernanski starts the bottom of the fifth by grounding to Lawless. Tom gone, one up and one down, and you saw Blylevin, and he will be on the mound. And the Cardinals have opted for Danny Cox. They're going to come out of their playoff rotation. Whitey Herzog wants John Tudor, who's had tremendous success in St. Louis, to pitch game three back in St. Louis. And it will be Cox who pitched so brilliantly in the playoff clincher tomorrow night on three days rest. A strike to Herbeck on one. Against Bert Blylevin, 15 game winner. Over 3,000 strikeouts. Two big wins for the uh, Twins in the playoff. So he's pitched very well. He's been prone to give up home runs, but nothing wrong with that. Threw a few in my day. Well, he's pitching to the right ball club. The Cardinals with only 94 home runs this year. They only had 58 last year. So for a pitcher who is prone to give up the home run ball, you don't mind. Of course, they can do a lot of other things to muster runs. But you would, you'd be glad to pitch against the Cardinals as opposed to the San Francisco Giants, for instance. Well, they but, only had 205, but you take Clark with 35 and Pelton's not a lineup with 12. You've subtracted what, 47, 47 yeah. home runs. Three and two, the count on Herbeck. It's exactly half, as a matter of fact. Plus, with Pendleton, you lose. A lot of defense. No knock at Tom Lawless, obviously, but I think the biggest thing, you lose 96 RBIs. And Herbeck is on. So Bob Forsh yields his first walk. It's been a perfect night for Herbeck. Two walks and a two-run single. And Steve Lombardozzi comes up. You know, the funny thing about the Twins, in talking with them yesterday, None of them said that he really thought he had a, a real good year, a real great year. And certainly when you looked at the figures, nobody had a career year for Minnesota. When teams win pennants, normally a bunch of guys have career years or you have dominating pitching or something. This is the ultimate team effort. Well, of yeah, course, the I, difference, is, excuse me, Tim, is, as you said, was is reared in 31 states. That's something they didn't have before. So. Again, confidence is so important in your ability to win. And yet Reardon, even though he had a, a good year and made a difference, didn't have that kind of spectacular year when a reliever comes in and is 40 saves and a 1.8 ERA. Reardon had a lot of saves, 31, but his ERA was 4.48. Primarily because of the first month and a half pitching for Minnesota. But if you look at all of their averages, they're about right in the middle. In the air to deep left field. And they're going to turn this place into Bedlam again. Tries to get it in, as you said, in Detroit on the last Sunday. Doesn't get it in, and there's the result. Only eight home runs, 
during the course of the season. Laudner hits a fly ball to center field, and Willie McGee is there for the second out. Steve Lombardozzi with Herbeck on board. And a curtain call for the man they call Lombo. And here's Gladden. One and oh. Fourth inning, bases loaded. First World Series slam in 17 years. Nine to one, Minnesota. Two out, bases empty in the bottom of the fifth. They've had a lot of firsts. Gary Gaetti, the first player ever to hit two home runs back to back in his first postseason game. He did that against the Tigers. I really think that's one of the things that got him the most valuable player. Brunaski had a great series, but yeah. I think what it did, the two home runs off Doyle Alexander, it made believers out of the Twins. Two balls, two strikes, with two out of the bases empty. On deck is Greg Gagney. Nine runs, eight hits, and no errors for the Twins. One run, three hits, and no errors for the Cardinals. The Twins going through the lineup for the fourth time in the game in the fifth inning, and Latin is on. Okay, I'd like to make the point again that uh, the, the, if, if the Cardinals were going to lose this game, they would have preferred to have lost a relatively close game because with Frank Viola, one of the keys for the Minnesota Twins, pitching on three days rest, he'll probably come back next Wednesday night in St. Louis. I think Tom Kelly has the luxury of seeing Viola possibly work about 70 to 75 pitches tonight. Get him out of there, use your bullpen, and have him rested next week. In the air to right field, Okendo goes into the corner and makes the catch in fair territory. But the Twins get two more on the Lombardozzi homer, and we go to the six with Minnesota leading 9-1. to one. To the sixth we go. Al Michaels with Jim Palmer and Tim McCarver. Game one of the World Series and the St. Louis Cardinals trailing 9-1. to one. The Minnesota Twins, winners of the ALCS in five, and picking up where they left off in Detroit on Monday. They've had four days of rest, and they come out tonight and throw up a nine spot through five. Ball one to Coleman. Coleman, Smith, and Her. And you talk about taking a team out of its game. The Cardinals scratching and clawing and speed. Forget that. In there for a strike, and you're down by eight. One and one. There is Joe Negro who might pitch in game four. Tom Kelly said if they lead three games to nothing. Brunanski chases this one into the corner and he owns that corner. It is a very tricky right field corner here in Minneapolis. Brunanski knows it very, very well. The Cardinals in their workouts were hitting balls into that corner so they could get used to the crazy caroms. Well, the first thing Jose Okendo said is that very tricky. Not only can you not see the ball when it comes off the bat, if it gets down into that corner, he said, I could have a problem. Ozzie Smith hits a grounder to short. And one shortstop throws out the other quickly to God. Have a look. The tarpaulin, the tall screen, and then right into the corner. And nobody knows that spot better than Brunanski. Yeah, you're not going to get a lot of caroms off of that hefty bag type of material that they have out there. <laughs> Tommy Hur now as Viola delivers his 77th pitch, and the point Tim makes is such a good one. Kelly has the luxury of 
getting Viola out of there with his huge lead and then bringing him back fresh on Wednesday. Well, you also give your relief, and we talked about Baron Gare and Reardon. You can give them an inning apiece. They have not pitched since Monday. Yep. Both pitch in that game. Get them acclimated to the World Series play. And Viola just sailing them along as Dagny takes care of her. At the end of five and a half, Twins nine, Cardinals one. Bottom of the sixth inning, Kirby Puckett to lead things off with Bob Forrest working in long relief. One and oh. Kirby has not joined the hit parade tonight, as you see, he has yet to hit the ball out of the infield. And that trend continues on a little pop up, which Lindemann takes care of. One away, so Puckett is gone. And it will bring up Gary Gaetti, who tonight will be known as Mr. First. First major league at bat back in 81, hit a homer. He hit those two against Detroit in game one of the ALCS. And tonight, he's the first since Merv Rettenmund in 1971 to get two hits in an inning. I tell you, and you can add to that, the first game of the 1982 season, he had two home runs in this ballpark in the first game of the season. And the first regular season game to be played here. Yeah, right. Park opening that year. Lawless throws it in the dirt, and Lee Wire was ready to signal out. It was in time, but Lindemann couldn't hold it. And it's an error, E5. Another look. Lawless throwing on the run. We've already seen it. Not a very strong throw from behind the bag. There, another throw that short hops him. Lindemann tries to come up with it. Unable to do it. Baylor now. Don has flied out, singled, and grounded out. The World Series following Baylor around. Don with the Red Sox last year. And had the Giants won, it would have put Kevin Mitchell into the World Series for the second straight year. He played with the Mets in 86. Fouled away. Funny thing about Baylor, they picked him up because of his persona, his presence, his experience, and the rest. But this is a, a ball club that's been together a long time. He didn't hurt, obviously. He, it was good to have a Baylor in the clubhouse, but the Twins were a, a pretty close-knit and well molded team to begin with. He certainly certainly didn't help the Twins like he helped the Boston Red Sox last year, because for that type of charisma to come out and to surface, you got to spend time with people. But you really never know what's going to happen. And when you look at the matchups, three left-handers in the starting rotation, the DH, he will have a chance to maybe play a little bit, not in the obviously in St. Louis ballpark. That's grounded to Ozzie Smith, and he'll settle for the out at first base, getting Baylor and moving Gaetti down to second. Rudansky will be the hitter. But it's nice to have somebody like Don Baylor who has been there before. He's not the player that he, he was last year when he hit 31 home runs, as you take a look at Ricky Horton. But he did hit 16, still plays the game very hard. He's, he's a great example for a lot of young players which form this Minnesota ball club. Bernanski's been around a long time, but, but they're still a little bit short in experience, not in talent. Two out, Gaetti at second, curve for a strike, 0 and 1. A lot of people were concerned about the fact that they won in five games and they were going to have five days off. And Tom Kelly, a firm believer, and important part of a player's ability is his legs. Had him doing a lot of running, simulated games. Matter of fact, we talked about Gary Gaetti. He's a guy that hit 31 home runs this year, 34 last year. But back to 1984, he only hit five. And Kelly attributes to hurting his Achilles tendon in spring training, never getting his legs under him. So one thing he wanted to have coming into this series was a well-conditioned ball club. So it made him work out during those off days. 1-1 one, one to Bruno is up high. We lapse into calling these guys by their nicknames occasionally. It's because here in Minnesota, they're known as Bruno and G-Man and Kirby and Herbie. 
Fab Four. Fab Four. Lombo. Yep, just a little local color for you, folks. <laughs> to center. And McGee spots this one, I think, and makes the catch. At the end of six, it is Minnesota nine, St. Louis one. That's right, Willie, three gone. Go back to the dugout. And we'll be back with game one after this word from your local station. Well, we go to the seventh inning. You know, the NFL loves to talk about parity. What about baseball? This is the seventh different team to represent the American League in the last seven years. And as a matter of fact, since divisional play started, uh, the American League has won ten World Series or nine World Series, and the National League's won nine World Series. <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe in miracles, huh? Well, they know all about miracles up here because the hockey team to which they refer, so many of them came from this area. They forgot yes. Yeah, that's that. right. <laughs> now they're waiting for uh, the clinch. Seventh inning as Jim Lindeman starts things off. Lindeman, McGee, and Pena, nine to one. Twins on top. A. Bartlett Jumahi, the president of the National League. Huh. You can rip, read lips. He said, swing the bat. <laughs> <laughs> Easy for him to say. <laughs> Easy for a Renaissance man to say that. I mean, liner caught by Gagne. Yeah, this has been anything but a divine comedy for <laughs> A. Bartlett Giamatti tonight. Poor guy sits there as the ultimate impartial observer all year long. Finally gets a chance to root, and his team is down by eight. Nine to one blowout. Good play by Gagne. Willie McGee now. 0 oh 1. Frank Viola working on McGee with one out in the seventh inning. Twins exploded for seven in the fourth, highlighted by Dan Gladden's grand slam, and a two run homer by La Bardozzi in the fifth. McGee singles in the center, so Willie has two hits tonight, and he is on. That's the first hit for the Cardinals since McGee with an infield hit in the fourth inning. To further expand what you talked about earlier, Tim, the luxury of Tom Kelly staying with Viola or giving his bullpen an inning or, or so apiece, it also makes it a lot easier if you're a veteran pitcher and you have command of your pitches to pitch with a nine to one lead. Every pitch doesn't mean the ball game as it would in a two to one type of game or a three to two game or whatever the case is. So the 84 pitches is really not a, a exceptionally low amount, but he's doing it without a lot of duress. Both mentally and physically. Pena. Strike. There is a Jeff Reardon, the bearded one, who will probably get the night off. The ace of the bullpen. One and one. Kind of funny, if, there, if there's a downside to a blowout game tonight is that the Twins have had four days off. Reardon's going to get another day off to make it five. Jim's point well taken the last inning that maybe by getting Baron Garen Reardon in for an inning might be the shrewd thing, thereby resting Viola. But Tom Kelly does not appear to be going in that direction. That's grounded to Gaetti over to Lombard Dozy. Back to Herbeck, double play. Dreamland under the dome. Well, superlative play by the Minnesota infield. We saw the line drive to Gagne here, Gaetti to Lombardozzi. You saw the agility, the arm strength, and Herbeck, outstanding fielding first baseman with a great pickup. So everybody played a part in that inning. And here is Herbeck to be followed by Lombardozzi and then Launder in the bottom of the seventh inning. 9 to 1 Minnesota on this double play routine because of the score but look how Lombardozzi uses the bag to prevent the runner 
Willie McGee from taking him out. There are a lot of ways that second baseman can do that. They can cheat and come across the bag, but on a slowly hit ball like that, it's often better to use that bag for defense. Runner can't get to you, he can't go through the bag. Even though some have tried doing that. And some have, I mean, look at Bill Madlock, Tony Fernandez. In the air to left field and a long run for Coleman and even with Vince's speed, he can't get there. So the count is two and two. So the Twins on top and meanwhile, Tom Kelly just sits and looks and watches and waits. Kelly, we mentioned before, a guy who, and there he is, a real good guy and a good sense of humor. He's in his office during the playoffs and somebody came to the stadium and somehow was able to get a hold of Tom on his office phone and the guy said the Lord has sent me to you to pitch the first game. And instead of blowing him off as some nut he talked to him for a while and he finally explained you know I'd love to use you but the league says you have to be with the team by September 1st. <laughs> And the guy said, okay, fine. That's Thank a you, very sir. diplomatic <laughs> way of handling things. What right? is that? <laughs> That's Tom Kelly. <laughs> Time called, no pitch. Well, I think he's finding one of the most difficult things, and it's really, uh, it's kind of snowballed the last couple of years is the media crush at a World Series. And you have to talk to people and whatever. And he says, I know it's boring, but we're going to do the best we can. Nothing different. That's a staple line. We'll do the best we can. And then he says, I know it's boring. 3-2 pitch is fouled away. But he's not a boring man. No. Uh, by no means. No. <laughs> Rick Horton on in relief. You saw him warming up in the bullpen, and he picks up here in the mop-up role in the seventh inning. Three balls, two strikes on Ken Herbeck. A little looper, and that'll be caught by Tom Lawless for the out, and it will bring up Lombardozzi. Another thing about Kelly is yesterday during the media crunch at the Twins' workout, a couple of kids apparently sneaked in along with the rest of the media from a school, a nearby school, and they had their own little handheld mini cam. They were going to take it back to their professor to show them that they could do some interviews. Kelly gave the guy an interview. They approach them and time sure. Strike. No one won the count on Lombardozzi. Will be the batter. It's amazing. Lombard does the home run. You think he might overswing. He goes back to the basics, which is why he's been an improved hitter. Hitting the ball back up the middle. And Horton had an excellent year for the Cardinals. If you look at their, their pitching, you look at Worrell as their stopper along with Ken Daly. But early in the year, when Daly was coming back from the elbow problems, Ricky Horton, and you saw the eight saves, he carried him the first month. Worrell hurt his arm, strained it. Eventually ended up with 33 saves, but Horton bailed him out early in the year when they needed a lot of wins. Well, he's so versatile, too. He can start, he can be in middle relief, and as you said, he can be used in short relief. 67 appearances this year. And as Al says, he can mop up. And, and that and we say that we don't mean that to denigrate a pitcher because Force came in, didn't wasn't very sharp. I mean, Kenny has won over 140 ball games, so he knows sometimes you have to take one for the club. You go out there, you give him the innings, even though you are not pitching up to your capabilities. Tough to concentrate in a ball game that is nine to one, but it will make Horton sharper the next time he has to pitch in this World Series if he does. Oh, and one the count, one out, and now 0 and two on Lautner. Well, there were a bunch of them, a dozen. Cardinals played right field this season, including 10 starters, Horton and Todd Worrell, who played there in one playoff game, were amongst the 12 in the regular season. An even better graphic, and I'm sure that Steve Hurt could come up with it, is how many putouts did they have? Did they, when they got out there, did they have any company? 
Ricky told me he had one ball hit over his head, went for a double. He said, but at least he hit the cutoff man. <laughs> did it go over his head or did he run in it? I mean, did he go into a really detailed description? He said he was playing deep and the ball was hit like a rocket against the Philadelphia Phillies. As a matter of fact, that's when Todd Worrell played right field also. I think he escaped. Yeah, he there. did. I right. don't think anything went his way. As a matter of fact, I think Ken Daly came in, struck out Von Hayes, and then Worrell came back in the ballgame. Laudner strikes out. And it will bring up the fellow the 40, or the uh, Giant fans used to call the man from Glad, Dan Glad. Just got to take a look at the strikeout of Timmy Laudner. What makes Ricky Horton, and it's very much like what we're going to see from John Tudor and maybe Greg Matthews, is the good change up to go along with the breaking ball and the fastball and excellent control. That ball down and away for the strikeout. One and the count on Dan Gladden. Grand slam in the fourth inning. Cardinals started the night with a run in the second, and then Minnesota exploded for seven in the fourth. Two more in the fifth. And it's been a night of joy and celebration in Minneapolis. I'll tell you what, if Steve Cardoza gets too far off first, it'll be a night of getting back to the dugout because Horton has one of the best pickoff moves in the National League, voted by the National League managers as the outstanding pickoff move. So even nine to one, you're not really in a hurry to, to get to second base unless there's a base hit. Again, I imagine the scouting report, the advanced scouting report, will tell him that. You get picked off when it's nine to one. You better be embarrassed no matter who's on the mound with what move. Well, I'll tell you, really, because it's nine to one, Lindemann now playing behind Lombardosi. Whitey Herzog figuring that Lombardosi's not going anywhere. Pretty safe assumption, I would say. <laughs> Strike three and one. And a strike, and it's three and two. Two out. Lombardozzi at first. Gladden. Rips one down the line and into the corner for extra bases. And let's see how Okendo plays the carom. He played it perfectly. But still, it can't stop another run from scoring. Ten to one. and Lombardozzi going back through the middle after the home run. A good piece of hitting by Gladden going the other way after the home run earlier in the ball game. And the reason for that, and I know you were thinking the same thing, when guys hit eight or nine home runs during a year and they happen to hit one, the best trait the next at bat is to hit the ball the other way. And the best thing to do, the reason for that, you don't become overly enamored with your power and don't start opening up thinking you're becoming a home run hitter. Lombardozzi did it, now Gladden did it. I think a hitting instructor would say realism. Be what you are. <laughs> About that many in the ballpark tonight. The Metrodome. 10 to 1 Minnesota with Gladden at second. Two down. Gagne hits a ground ball to the hole. Ozzie Smith throws on the run and gets him. A nice play, but very much lost in the shuffle tonight. We go to the eighth, 10 to 1, Minnesota. Frank Viola, who has not lost here since May. The beneficiary of a 10 1 advantage as we go to the eighth inning. Jose Okendo to start things, taking inside ball one. Okendo, Pagnazzi, and Lawless in the eighth. 
One and one. And in the bullpen, Keith Atherton is probably, more than anything else, just getting in some throwing. He's one of the long men. Conceivably, he could come in, but you've got to start thinking about throwing between appearances, if nothing else, right now. Also, Jeff Reardon has gone down to the bullpen, and in a 10-to-1 ball game, you wouldn't think he would go to the bullpen unless he was going to be up in the ninth inning. Two balls, one strike to count. Two and two. <laughs> Those are the hands of somebody normally when the score is five to four. Down on strikes he goes. And strikeout number five. One gone here in the eighth inning. And Pagnazzi is the batter. Pagnazzi, one of the three rookies in the Cardinal lineup tonight. Lindemann, Pagnazzi, and the starting pitcher, McGrain. Tomorrow night, Danny Cox will try to get the Cardinals even, and Bert Blylevin will be on the mound for Minnesota. Fouled away. Monday is an off day. Series goes to St. Louis on Tuesday. And on Tuesday, it will be John Tudor, who is great at home against Les Straker, the Twins' number three starter. Well, I think you brought up a very interesting point yesterday when we were talking about sometimes the length. You see a base hit up the middle by Pagnazzi. The length of a playoff series to get you to the World Series dictates how you set up your pitchers. And Whitey Herzog would have liked to have Danny Cox pitch the first game. Again, thinking about the fact that the Twins have such a fantastic record here at the Metrodome. We talked about it, 56 and 25, another two playoff wins. Like to have Cox going in a situation where you start out here, keep you in the ball game. You don't have to go with a rookie like McGrain. Possibility never coming back here. Lawless has struck out twice tonight. 0 and 1. So there's Whitey leaning on the wall and probably thinking about tomorrow night. Well, 10 to 1 ball games will get you in that mood, but some mood. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of people, and maybe it's just a rationalization of, of losing by a, a big score, will always tell you it's better to get blown out than to, to win those heartbreakers or lose those heartbreakers 2 to 1 or 3 to 2. Press the thing about. Frank Viola's stats, the economy, the lack of walks. A lot of times, the pitchers will tell you they lose their concentration when you get a big lead. That has not been the case tonight. Pagnazzi can roam free at first, down by nine. Herbeck playing behind him. Oh, and two on Lawless. Talked about the, how the Cardinals won their series. What about the way the Twins won their series? They beat the Tigers in five games. And you could have seen Bly Levin or perhaps Viola in game six or seven if it had gone that far, which would have messed up their rotation. Lombardozzi and Gagne have a little communication problem, but still, Lombo comes up with a catch. And there are two down. Even at home, it's so loud here, they didn't hear each other. Well, it's hard for us to really know whether you can hear each other talking, and you know they're trying to communicate. Tom Kelly talked about the fact that, as you see Lon Bordozzi make the catch and Gagne trip, he said you can't even turn to somebody sometimes in the dugout and talk to him and hear him. No wonder he's so quiet. It's nothing to do with his personality. <laughs> Coleman is the batter. You know, one of the more amazing things I thought when watching the uh, twin celebration the other day, when they win the pennant, Kelly, he, he sat in the dugout, and he just he let the players have their moment on the field. And here's a, a rookie manager, a guy who is fortunate to get a job, and they really made him wait. And the next thing you know, I mean, he wins a pennant, and he just he sits there, and he's happy to let everybody else share the glory and enjoy the moment. They'll all tell you to the, to the man when you 
talk about Tom Kelly, they said he's one of us. He's no different. Ken Herbrecht said he'll even cheat in cards along with all of us. He's a native Minnesotan, even though he moved from here when he was very young and grew up in New Jersey. Still makes his home there. Gagney to Lombardozzi and to the bottom of the eighth. Minnesota 10, St. Louis 1 in game one. Under the dome, where everybody is smiling, and where Steve Lake has come in to catch now for St. Louis with the score 10 to 1. Kirby Puckett starts things off. Puckett has not joined the hit parade tonight. He's 0 for 4, and he's coming off a slow ALCS, so he's a guy ready to explode. Well, very, uh, I mean, for a 332 hitter with 28 home runs, he only walked 32 times, so you get the idea that he is not a very patient hitter. Into right field for a base hit. Not very patient, but very gifted. Well, if you're not patient, you have to be gifted. <laughs> Now Greg Gagne is the only one in the lineup that has not had a base hit tonight. Greg 0 for 5, but that's a happy 0 for 5 if there's such a thing as a happy 0 for 5. Yeah, right. Clubs up 10 to 1, you'll take an 0 for any time. Gaetti hits a fly ball to shallow center field. McGee having trouble and drops the ball, but he can still get a force and does. Smith is on the bag. Puckett had to wait. And so McGee will not get what would have been an error. Instead, it's your basic 8-6 force out. Third time tonight that an outfielder has lost a ball. Two by the Cardinals and once by the Twins. Kirby Puckett lost a ball earlier. As a matter of fact, that led to the only Cardinal run back in the second inning. Don Baylor. Want to know the count. You know, when you think about it, I guess the players are right that come in here and the, the Twins having such a superior home record and all of the players talk about the white ceiling. I mean, you would think that they would have it painted a different color. White on white belongs in shirts, not in <laughs> baseball against the ceiling. Two and one the count. Oh, that's why Billy Martin, a man that's never been known to overreact, <laughs> says they ought to spend 100 grand and paint the thing. Well, he's right. And George agreed with him. Wallace to her and back to first double play. Five, four, three. To get Baylor and take care of the Twins. On to the night, Minnesota leading. 10 to 1. The Twin Cities are lit up in more ways than one. There it is on a skyscraper in downtown Minneapolis. A live shot. Win Twins. The rallying cry here as we go to the ninth inning. 10 to 1. And Ozzie Smith to lead things off. Looks like how they have Gene Larkin at first and possibly in right field Mark Davidson. Tom Kelly can give some other players some experience. There's Larkin, the Columbia University graduate. They yeah. beat Yale today. Yeah. And Keith did. Atherton is the new pitcher. Columbia beat Yale today? No, I was saying, did they beat oh. Yale? They had lost 35 in a row, and they were playing Yale today. We saw A. Bartlett Giamatti. And Gene Larkin went to Columbia. Well, we'll get our crack staff yeah. now to answer that question. See the numbers of Keith Atherton. Last year, 10 saves. This year, only two. But again, uh, as almost all the twins on this li lineup have done over the course of the season, they play a role. And when Juan Berenguer was hurt early in the year, talking right there, Gene Larkin, Atherton came in, set up Jeff Reardon. The reasons he had such a successful year. 
Smith flies to Gladden. Larkin at first, and Mark Davidson is the, the new right fielder. Mark, a defensive specialist. Tommy Hur with one out of the bases empty. Hur is 0 for 3. Strike. At Yale, we understand, won that game 27 to 13. So it's up to Larkin to uphold the, the colors of good old CU. 36 in a row, and they had broken the Northwestern University losing streak of 34 collegiate games in a row. They did that last year. Her flying to Gladden and left for the second out. And it'll be Lindemann. Congratulations, yep, to John, to, John. to his brother. Yep, yes, a, sir. A message to his brother, married earlier today. Oh, that's wonderful. Sure, it's a mutual message. John saying congratulations, Frank. Mm -hmm. Atherton trying to close it. Larkin has no room. On one. Meanwhile, Whitey Herzog, the last time he appeared in a World Series, he lost 11 to nothing in Game 7. Poor Whitey is now down a composite 21 to 1 in his last two World Series games. Like Ty Pei against the United States in the Little League World Series with the exact score. Gaetti will end it on a nice play. Twins win game one of the 87 World Series. 